So deep learning inferencing is important because deep learning is solving a lot of practical problems, uh, including image and natural language processing. But managing deep learning inferencing at scale, which is often done at the cloud for flexible resources, presents challenges in cost and operational complexity. Uh, cost challenges include the fact that DL models differ greatly and the resources they need, particularly the memory they need for their weights. So it's important to use instance types that are right-sized for the model sizes. Secondly, in production, a model's load can vary a great deal over time, uh, for example, by time of day and so on. So it's desirable to automatically choose the right number of instances for the load that's being presented. And finally, x86 plus GPU instances, which are often used to serve deep learning models, are pretty spendy compared to, for example, CPU-only uh, instances. And so it's worthwhile to evaluate if your uh, workload and use case can be well handled by the thriftier CPU instances. In the area of operational complexity, selecting currently available minimum-sized cloud resources is important. They need to match the resourcing needs of the model now and when the model changes over time. And they need to be chosen from the large and ever-evolving instance types in the cloud uh, whose availability at any particular time may also change over time. Um, so in this talk, we'll present an approach to handling the cost and operational complexity of deep learning inferencing at scale. Given cloud resources, that are organized in Kubernetes clusters for production container orchestration, the approach combines two things, right-sizing the inference resources and right-sizing the inference compute type. For right-sizing the inference resources, we use a Lodal Luna Smart node provisioner, which adds right-size um, compute to the cloud Kubernetes cluster when needed and removes it when not. Um, for right-sizing the inference compute type, we use the Ampere A1 ARM compute with the Ampere optimized AI library. This combination provides a good price performance advantage for DL relative to GPU and even other CPU systems for low latency, uh, low batch size use cases. We'll show the benefits of the right size approach by comparing its cost and operational complexity with that of a non-right-sized resource provisioning system uh, with non-right-sized um, compute types. And we'll do that comparison for Oracle Cloud OKE and for Google Cloud uh, GKE. So looking first at the right-sizing of inference resources using a load of Luna, Luna adds nodes to a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud to handle placements that are pending. Um, and it does that according to its policy around bin packing versus bin selection, as shown at the bottom of this uh, slide. So bin packing means it chooses a node where multiple pods can be placed. And this is good if the pods have a similar lifetime. Bin selection uh, places pods in a node that's right-sized for that particular pod. And this is nice for having flexible lifetimes for the pods and having the resourcing well match the size of the pods. Luna is suitable for handling any bursty workload uh, in the cloud, and we've previously reported on Luna's management of x86 plus GPU compute for doing deep learning training rather than inferencing. Um, and we talked about that with respect to Ludwig AutoML for deep learning, running on Raytune uh, for tabular and text classification data sets. And it was simple to adapt Luna to this new workload of inferencing. We enabled its uh, option to uh, allocate ARM instances as well as its default instances, which are x86. We tuned its bin packing versus bin selection um, policy because uh, the ARM instances tend to have much smaller um, available uh, instance types, which makes them better suited to being able to handle a small pod size. And finally, we added support for Luna itself to run on ARM, which can be useful if you want to create an ARM-only cluster. Turning our attention to right-sizing of the inference compute type, uh, we use this Ampere A1 compute type, which is available on both Google and on Oracle, with the Ampere optimized library. And this is a system that's been tuned for DL inferencing without uh, accuracy degradation. Um, now, stepping back, I should say that the latest ML Commons benchmarking for inferencing showed GPUs delivering the highest absolute performance. But your mileage may vary. 
uh, low latency, small batch size cloud server scenarios like ours uh, were, ran more cost efficiently on CPU only. So pre-deployment testing for our workload showed that was the case. And so for our right size runs, we did not request any GPUs. We just requested CPUs and Luna chose the ARM A1 instance as being a cheaper CPU system for the resources requested than the x86. So to demonstrate the value and benefits of right sizing, we wanted to select a tunable DL inferencing system that was deployable on cloud Kubernetes and that included auto scaling. And so to meet all these requirements, we chose TorchServe, which is a high performance, full featured serving system. Um, it supports tuning resources uh, on particular for different models that are running on the system. It can be deployed on the cloud. So the picture at the bottom of the screen shows it being deployed on AWS. Um, and it has a load triggered auto scaling system based on a Kubernetes horizontal pod auto scaler. And so that horizontal pod auto scaler adds and removes instances from TorchServe workers um, behind a load balancing front end of TorchServe. We wanted to show the benefits of our system by also demonstrating it working on two different models. These two different models are solving the same problem, but you can see that they're dramatically different in their memory requirements. Uh, VGG 16, it needs more than, it needs, you know, in excess of 130 million weights, whereas SqueezeNet is um, 1.2 million weights. Now, these are two models both solving the image classification problem, uh, but doing so with greatly different amount of resources. For our testing, we actually deployed two copies of TorchServe, one copy for VGG16 and one copy for SqueezeNet on the same Kubernetes cluster. And we did this for two reasons. One was to allow the deployment of TorchServe to request workers that were well-sized for the particular model being delivered, and we saw the models have two dramatically different sizes. And secondly, we wanted the load scaling to happen per model. So you can imagine times of the day that VGG16 was popular and SqueezeNet was not, and vice versa. So we wanted that independent kind of scaling. And so this is a depiction at the bottom of this slide of our deployment. So you see the two copies of TorchServe, one for each of the two kinds of models, running in a cloud Kubernetes cluster. And you see the horizontal pod autoscaler for each deployment, adding and removing pods for that deployment, depending on the load being presented to that model. And you see uh, uh, the uh, smart node provisioner, Luna's smart node provisioner, watching the system, adding nodes to the cluster when they're needed, and removing loads from the cluster when they're not needed. We compared three configurations, our right-sized configuration with two other configurations we thought would be, uh, you know, we see as being reasonably popular. The first is a max size configuration. This is just, I'm gonna set up my Kubernetes cluster to handle the max you know, load I ever expect my model to get for these two models. And I'm going to deploy um, you know, the, the safe choice of x86 plus GPU uh, as being my instance type. So this is sort of the operational model here is, you know, I, I max out everything and I never have to scale. Um, the second configuration we compared with was the idea that I scale the number of nodes, but each of the nodes is the same size. And so this is kind of like the operational model you would get with the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler if you had a node pool defined that was just delivering the x86 plus GPU nodes. Um, we measured and generated each peak load using the hay load generator with 150 parallel threads, requesting image classification for this kitten picture. Um, we configured TorchServe for low latency, so uh, single worker threads, single Netty threads. And we set up the TorchServe horizontal pod on the scaler to scale based on CPU utilization, you know, greater than or less than 50% um, spread across the cluster. Um, and, and I note that even when you're using GPU-based systems, this trigger uh, works fine because there's a lot of load on the CPU as well, even when you're using a GPU. And we set max replicas that you could scale between to, with the idea that we wanted when the max load was presented, uh, according to our system, uh, that you would get less than half a second of latency at the 99th percentile end to end. So we had tested to determine uh, how many instances were needed to maintain that. 
So let's look first at the results on OKE. So the Kubernetes cluster itself has two statically allocated CPU nodes to handle just management, including the Luna uh, pods itself. Uh, these were Ampere ARM nodes. Uh, these were um, uh, A1 flex, uh, each cost about seven cents an hour. For TorchServe, each of the model um, deployments uh, had a minimum worker of set to one worker, so that there's always at least one worker running, even when the model is idle. For right-sized, we requested 400 millicores and four gigabytes to handle that uh, big model. And we received a, an A1 flex with 1.0 CPU and with four gig. Uh, for the dynamic max-sized and for the max-sized, we um, used the same configuration for the requested worker size, but plus a GPU. And for those two cases, we got a um, GPU 2.1 instance type uh, from Oracle. This is the cheapest uh, GPU instance type available currently at Oracle. Um, similarly, for SqueezeNet, we asked for 400 millicores, but only one gigabyte for our right-sized, and we got the A1 Flex, but with only um, one gigabyte of memory this time instead of uh, four. And similarly, for the uh, dynamic fixed size, and for the max size, we got, again, the GPU T.1. Um, at the max you know, peak load, right size required four of these instances to handle the load. And the GPU systems only required three. So first of all, we wanted to make sure we weren't diluting the quality of the results. So we made sure that the predictions, whether you're running on any of the three configurations, deliver the same prediction results and that they do so within our latency um, expectations, even at peak load. So once that's out of the way, we said, OK, how much is this costing us? And we looked at four different scenarios or operating points to think about cost. One is when both models are idle. One is when both models are at their peak. And one is when one model is peaking and the other model is idle. So looking at those four cost points, uh, we uh, compiled this set of numbers. So basically, you know, the first column uh, of the uh, numbers is the max sized cost per hour, next dynamic fixed size, and finally the right sized. And that's what you see on the left hand side at the bottom of the screen. And on the right hand side, you see in the blue the dynamic fixed size compared as a ratio to max sized. And in the red, you see our right sized compared to max size. So, first of all, what you see is Dynamic fixed size saves you a fair amount of money when you are not at peak. So that's great. But you get way more savings when you're doing right sizing um, in, in all four of the operating scenarios. So almost two orders of magnitude savings in cost um, compared to max sized. And one other thing I should mention is that the cheap GPUs that we got at Oracle, the, the cheapest ones that Oracle has, they're considered legacy. So if we were actually running with the GPUs, which Oracle considers the current generation, the cost of the max, max um, uh, sized and the dynamic fixed size would be quite a bit higher. So now let's turn our attention to the Google Cloud <coughs> and the results there. Again, we had the two statically allocated nodes that were always available in the cluster for things like running Luna and so on. Again, used Ampere A1 ARM for those. Um, they were each uh, two G BCPUs and A gig uh, at about eight cents an hour. Um, and again, TorchServe was deployed similarly with similar um, requests for the TorchServe um, worker sizes. So in this case, we got uh, T2A standard uh, two for the uh, nodes that would match the right-sized workers, and we got an instance type that involved the T4 GPU uh, for the fixed size dynamic and for the max size. Um, in this case, uh, again, the second SqueezeNet configuration needed less memory, although it needed more memory for GPU, so that's kind of an interesting thing when you're running GPU, it actually has an impact on CPU memory because you need to stage the, the things that are being written to the GPU. So we actually had to jack up the, the memory requirements there. So in these deployments, again, it took four nodes 
at peak to satisfy the peak at the latency we were looking for. It took more nodes here in this GPU. This is a less powerful GPU than the one we used on Oracle, but these GPU nodes are cheaper. So overall, it was kind of a wash in terms of cost uh, here versus Oracle, for example. So again, we needed to make sure we weren't compromising the accuracy of the model or the latency with which the results were being delivered at peak load. So this is a similar table to what we saw for Oracle, but this is for GKE. So on the left-hand side, we have the costs, and on the right-hand side, we have the ratio for you know, the dynamic fixed size to max size and for the right size to max size. So again, when both models are not at peak, dynamic fixed size does save quite a bit of cost. You can see the blue bars are lower. Um, but again, the, uh, the right-sized system is you know, dramatically lower. Again, about two orders of magnitude. So it's kind of interesting, even though the GPU costs and the, you know, even the Ampere instance costs are slightly different between the two clouds, the kind of the bottom line is the same. So what about operational complexity? You know, usually as you're trying to be more efficient, it's actually costing you something in operational complexity. So looking at operational complexity in terms of three scenarios, uh, we evaluated uh, this, these three configurations to see how they responded. And these scenarios involve changes to the system where an operator might have to come in and do something to fix things. So the first kind of change in the system is what if we decided that dynamic load that we wanted to support, so peak load, was different than we had originally planned for. So our model's super successful, we want to have a higher peak, or our model is not as successful as we'd hoped, we want a lower peak. Either way, uh, you know, we want to uh, change the max uh, replicas in TorchServe. So for both the right sized and the dynamic fixed size, this kind of change would automatically be handled by the lower level um, you know, infrastructure. So there's no operational complexity in the stack for this kind of change. Whereas if you were configuring the Kubernetes cluster for max, you know, sized, you know, if you change the peak load and the, how much workers you want for that load, you actually manually have to go and change that Kubernetes cluster setup. The second kind of change would be a change in the worker size being requested. Now we ran our experiments with standard models and those standard models aren't going to change in their worker size. But in real life, as you're developing a model, you're improving it, you're retraining it, you're trying new architectures, the model size itself is going to change. And so your request of what the actual worker size is going to change. And when that happens, you know, we look at these three kinds of configurations and see how they respond in terms of what kind of operational complexity it adds. So if you change the worker size, both the max sized and the dynamic fixed size, you need to go back and revisit whether the node you know, type that you chose is appropriate for that kind of change. And if it's not, you need to make some change, for example, in the node groups. For right sized, it's happy to allocate something that matches your request. And so if your request is different now, it's going to allocate a node that matches that new difference. So it's, uh, again, no manual intervention or operational cost there. And the final set of changes that can happen, and I certainly see this, is changes in the cloud itself. You may have decided a particular instance you like, and that instance actually isn't available right now. I, you know, I used to think the cloud was infinite, but it's apparently not, you know? and particularly uh, when you're using GPU instances, there may be a problem with actually getting them. So if the cloud doesn't have the instance type you like, or if the cloud changes the costs of the instance types relative to each other, or if the cloud introduces new instance types or deprecates old ones, do you have to do something in your layer? So for both the max sized and the dynamic fixed size, you know, you are going to have to do something. It's not like there's no operational complexity there if there's a, an availability problem or a change in the types. But for right sized, again, uh, the costs and the sizes and the availability is baked in. So for example, if Luna tries to allocate a particular node and they're not available of that type, it retries with the next cheapest node. So there's no operational complexity for that kind of problem. Um, and if the kinds of instances and their costs change, uh, Luna can respond to that. So in summary, uh, right sizing can reduce 
cloud resource costs you know, significantly, and we showed that at four operating points on two different clouds. Um, and it avoids the operational complexity of the model resource costs and of the cloud changes. But wait, <laughs> one more thing. <laughs> Any of you are Columbo fans? Um, so if you, I just want to mention one other um, aspect here. It may be that this Kubernetes cluster you're using for um, inferencing is not the only Kubernetes cluster in your portfolio. Maybe you have a cluster for training. Maybe you have a cluster for CI, CD. You have a lot of clusters. And it starts to get complex just for your users to understand which cluster they should be talking to. And you may want to change it over time. Uh, so in addition to Luna, uh, Alotal has a system called Nova where the user can talk to a single cluster and make a request and it can be scheduled on the appropriate target cluster. So something to keep in mind, kind of a combination there that can be useful to people. Uh, so anyway, I invite you to write, you, maybe you have a deep learning inferencing workload or maybe you have some other kind of workload, but I invite you to try right sizing on your workload and see how it works for you. Uh, there's some resources on this slide to get you started. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Ann. Uh, so we have time for questions before we move on to the next great shuffle and mix. Anybody got any questions for Ann? Yeah, go ahead. Ann, if you could repeat the question for everybody. Okay. Um, I just have a question. Do you think Luna is productively used for non ML workloads? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so the question is can Luna be used for non ML workloads? Actually, the interesting thing here is Luna was originally developed for CI CD workloads as kind of a very example bursty work. Uh, workload. And I had been working in machine learning and, you know, Madri and I talked and we were like, wouldn't it be great to use this for machine learning, particularly because the instances can be so expensive on, on the training side in particular. But yeah, anything that's bursty. So, you know, I don't know if you've got a workload in mind, but I think there's many workloads where you don't want to pay for your resources all the time. Thanks. I have the same question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Cool. Have you experimented with other workloads as opposed to the ones that the CI/CD? Have you touched on other uh, experiments that um, this, this demonstrates some um, some uh, future for? Okay, yeah. I mean, for me, um, deep learning training, serving CI/CD, Madri, uh, do you have other? Yeah, yeah. So do you have experimented with some production workloads? Uh, here, okay. go ahead and use that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we have experimented with some production workloads, but we cannot uh, for sure say that Luna will be useful for those uh, production workloads because it depends on the shape, uh, the resource form factor of the workloads and their life cycle. Um, so it, you can't for sure say that Luna would be helpful, but for bursty workloads, you can for sure say that, yeah, there's, there's use for Luna out there. Does that make sense? Great, anybody else wanna? Ask a question? Just about the right time here. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, Thank Anne. Thank you. Thank you.